This video is for Hess's Law Part 1. This is the notes that were done in class, and you should have a fill-in-the-blank version of the notes um, to use and follow along with. If you do not have them, download them from the website. We will be taking a look at some information on Hess's Law, enthalpy, and looking at some examples. Enthalpy. Enthalpy is a measure of heat energy that is used or released in a system. Usually we express enthalpy as a change in enthalpy or delta H. You can think of enthalpy as um, heat energy or just energy. So enthalpy can be measured using calorimetry, which we did the calorimetry simulation in class. In terms of a chemical in terms of chemical reactions, the value for Q or heat from the Q plus MC to delta T equation is equal to the value for delta H when we're talking about chemical reactions. So we can use calorimetry to measure the heat flow of a reaction. Um, and when we calculate Q, we're actually calculating delta H as well. The sign for enthalpy, delta H, can be expressed as a negative or positive value. If you have a negative delta H, it means that the reaction is losing energy or is going through an exothermic process. So energy is leaving. That's why it's negative. It's being subtracted. A positive delta H means that the reaction is gaining energy or going through an endothermic process. Energy is being added to the system or added to the reaction. And that energy is used in the reaction and um, it's not really, the energy is going in, but we don't feel it getting hotter, which is typically where students get a little bit confused. So the endothermic process energy is going in and it's being used in the chemical reaction to make the reaction work. So as a learning check, which of the following is an endothermic process? Take a second and think about it. So the answer should be answer C, the silver nitrate forming silver ion and nitrate ion. That is an endothermic process because the delta H value is positive. All the others are negative values, so that means they are exothermic. And we can see like reaction A, we've got methane burning with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. That's a combustion reaction. It's going to give off energy. Um, so those are kind of the reactions we look at in this. Enthalpies of reactions. Reactions can also be written with the energy as a reactant or product. So this is something we might see in class. When the reaction is exothermic, it will show the enthalpy as a product since the energy is being released. So we can think of it as just another thing that's formed um, as a product in the reaction. So this reaction has methane plus oxygen forming water, carbon dioxide, and 890 kilojoules of energy. So that energy is being produced and given off. It's exothermic. When the reaction is endothermic, the enthalpy will be a reactant since it's being taken in during the reaction. This type of reaction will feel cold to us since the energy is being, being taken from the surroundings and trapped in the new bonds that are forming or used to actually get the reaction to happen. So for instance, we've got silver nitrate here. We add energy to it to make it break into the silver and nitrate ions. It's endothermic. So we can see that these show um, there's no negative or positive on these values. They're just either on the left side of the reaction or the right side of the reaction. It's a reactant or product to show if it's endo or exothermic. So what is Hess's Law? Hess's Law is a way to find the actual enthalpy of a reaction through calculations. Enthalpy is what we call a state function. So it means that the change in enthalpy, sort of going from some initial state to some final state, is independent of the pathway taken. So what does this mean for us? This means that we can use multiple ways to calculate the enthalpy of a chemical reaction. We will see the first way demonstrated in this set of notes and another way later. That's in the second video, the Hess's Law Part 2 video. So Hess's Law states that the change in enthalpy, or delta H, for a process involving, involving the transformation of reactants into products 
is not dependent on the path. So we don't care where you, um, what happened during the reaction. We care where we started and where we ended in terms of energy. So we, it's independent on the path. It could go through multiple different steps. All we want to know is the beginning reactants and the final products and their change in entropy. So let's take a look at this reaction. We have nitrogen plus two oxygen molecules giving us nitrogen two nitrogen dioxide um, molecules. And the change in enthalpy is 68 kilojoules. So there are 68 kilojoules of energy. And because it's positive, those are gained by this reaction. So those kilojoules of energy are going into the reaction container. So since these are all gases, our container will be closed to hold in all the gas, and the energy is being pulled from the environment and the surroundings to make this reaction work. We can also break this down into some separate reactions. So that reaction on the previous slide can be carried out into individual steps. The nitrogen and one oxygen can combine to form two nitrogen monoxide molecules. And that has a delta H of 180 kilojoules. So it's going to take in 180 kilojoules of energy to get this first reaction to work, to break up that nitrogen molecule, to break up that oxygen molecule, and to form them into nitrogen monoxide. Then in the second step, that nitrogen monoxide is going to add to another oxygen molecule and make the two nitrogen dioxide molecules. This has its very own change in enthalpy negative 112 kilojoules of energy. So what we have here is 180 kilojoules going in to the reaction in the first step and 112 kilojoules going out in the second step. So if we want to find the overall change in enthalpy for this whole reaction, we need to simply put these amounts of enthalpy together and find their difference. So we can take these two reactions from the previous slide and add them just like a math equation. We can see we've got the nitrogen and oxygen forming the nitrogen monoxide and then our nitrogen monoxide plus oxygen making the two nitrogen uh, dioxide molecules. So the first thing you can notice is that the um, nitrogen monoxide on the first reaction, the product, is used up in the, as a reactant in the second reaction. So when something appears on both sides of the reaction, um, we can cancel them out. We can cross out our NO in the first reaction and our NO in the second reaction. You'll also see that our oxygen molecules are on the same side. And what we can do when we put these two reactions together is actually add the two oxygen molecules together and get two molecules of oxygen gas. So we can add the two reactions together, and when we do that, we also add the delta H values, and we get 68 kilojoules of energy, which we saw a few slides ago for this overall reaction. So the important thing to note in these reactions is that, or in this example, is that the sum of the changes in enthalpy for the two reaction steps is equal to the change in enthalpy for the reaction of interest. So the original reaction we looked at had 68 kilojoules of energy overall going into the reaction container. And when we broke it down into the two steps, we could see that if we added their amounts of enthalpy together, we got an overall change of 68 kilojoules of energy. So the big idea here, by big idea here is we can combine reactions of known enthalpy changes to determine the change in enthalpy for the overall combined reaction. So this gives us a method of actually finding the enthalpy of a reaction. One thing that we can add, um, an important detail we have here, so we're presented with multiple reactions and have to manipulate them to get them to add up to a specific reaction. So we need a couple of um, strategies to use. One strategy we can use is that we can reverse the direction of a reaction when making a combined reaction. So we've got the nitrogen plus two oxygen making nitrogen dioxide. If we were to take that reaction and flip it around and reverse it, 
where the root products become the reactant and the reactants become the product. All that does is change the sign of our change in enthalpy value, our delta H value. So instead of being positive 68 kilojoules, we get negative 68 kilojoules. This is one of our strategies we can use. Our other strategy you can use to help us manipulate our reactions is um, multiplying our reaction. So the magnitude of the change in enthalpy or the size of our change in enthalpy is directly proportional to the quantities of our chemicals involved. So if the coefficients of a reaction are multiplied by some number, the value of our delta H can also be multiplied by that number and it holds true for that reaction. So if we were to take this reaction and multiply it by a, a coefficient, something like two, we would also multiply the change in enthalpy by two. So our new reaction would have coefficients of two, four, and four, and our new change in enthalpy, 68 times two gives us 136. So this is a way to, another way to manipulate our reactions to get them to cancel out properly and add to the reaction of the interest that we have. A couple of tips when doing these problems, just things to keep in the back of your head. Um, when trying to combine the reactions to form a reaction of interest, it is usually best to work backward from that reaction of interest. So find it, it's also good to focus on one chemical at a time. So pick one of the chemicals in the reaction of interest and then look at the reactions you're given and try to manipulate them to get that chemical on the proper side and with the proper coefficient. Um, if there's chemicals that are repeated between reactions, it's good to keep them till the end because it's hard to see how exactly to make them work if they're in multiple reactions. So those are a couple tips that we keep in mind as we do these problems. So here's our first example of the, the, these type of problems. So up at the top we have a reaction, three carbons, and it has in parentheses GR, which we're not as familiar with, but carbon comes in a couple forms, or in a couple forms. One of them is graphite, um, and the other would be diamond, so it's all D there. Um, but stating that, it would be carbon in the form of diamond. But this time we're reacting graphite, just like in your pencils, plus four hydrogen molecules as a gas gives us C3H8 gas, which we would commonly know as propane. And we want to find the change in enthalpy of this reaction. So we're given the following reactions to combine and find delta H. We have three reactions given, and each of them has their very own delta H value. So we are going to manipulate around these reactions to try and form that overall reaction at the top. So I like to break this down into steps. I like to start with my first chemical in the reaction at the top. We've got our three carbons as graphite. So looking at the other three reactions given, we want to find that carbon in one of those reactions. And you can see it's the very first chemical in the first reaction. So that's going to be our first reaction we are going to use. Now what we need to do is make sure the carbon is on the correct side of the reaction and that has the correct coefficient. We can see it's on the correct side of the reaction. It's on the left and so is the carbon in the original reaction at the top. And um, we can check its coefficient. Right now this carbon only has a coefficient of 1 and we need it to have a coefficient of 3. So what we're going to do is multiply that reaction by a coefficient of 3. So that means each of the chemicals will multiply its coefficient by 3 and we will um, rewrite the reaction. So here's our reaction, all with the coefficients of 3. And what this also does is multiplies our change in enthalpy by 3. So we get negative 1182 kilojoules for its new enthalpy because they are proportional. The next thing, oh, the next thing I like to do is put a box around my carbon, that piece that I wanted to find from my original reaction. 
I like to do this just so I'm keeping track of all the pieces I have and trying to figure out my puzzle here. The next chemical we have is the four hydrogen molecules up in the very top reaction. So we need to find that hydrogen molecule in one of the reactions below. We've already used the first one, so we'll do it for the second and third. You can see the hydrogen is in the third reaction and it has a coefficient of 2 on it. So we want a coefficient of 4. So it's one thing we're going to have to do is change the coefficient. And we want to check if it's on the correct side of the reaction, which it is. So we've got both chemical or that chemical on the left side um, of the reaction, so we're okay. So all we need to do is change the coefficient. Um, we can see we have a coefficient of 2, we want a coefficient of 4, so we need to multiply this reaction by 2. So we multiply that by 2, we can see our new coefficients are 4, 2, and 4, and that also multiplies our change in enthalpy by 2. So we went from negative 572 to negative 1144 kilojoules. And then we put a box around the hydrogen because that is our piece that we are getting from that reaction. Our next thing, or our very last chemical we need, is the C3H8, the propane. We can see the middle reaction has that propane in it. We check to see if it's on the correct side of the reaction, which unfortunately it's not. It's on the left side, and we need it to be on the product or on the right side. So we're going to have to flip this reaction around. We can also check the coefficient. Both of them have a coefficient of 1, so that is consistent. So all we need to do is flip this reaction. So the three carbon dioxide and the four water molecules will become our reactants, and the propane and the five oxygen molecules will become our product. And when we do that, that just simply changes the sign um, from negative to positive when we dot each value. So here's our reaction. And we're going to put a box around this CPHH, the propane, because that's our third piece to our original reaction. So we have all three pieces that we need. Next, we are going to check and make sure that everything else in the reaction cancels out. So we um, start taking a look. I immediately notice the CO2s. We have three carbon dioxide molecules on the reactant side in the bottom reaction, and three carbon dioxide molecules in the product side in the top reaction. So since they're on opposite sides, they can cancel out with one another and get rid of them. You can also see that we have the four water molecules on both sides of the reaction, so we can cancel those out. And then our last piece, we can see on the left we have three oxygens and two oxygens. Since they're on the same side, those would add to five oxygen molecules. And then in the bottom reaction, we have five oxygen molecules on the right. All of that would cancel out, and we would be left with only our um, original reaction at the top. So now that we know that everything cancels and we have our three pieces for our reaction, we can add up our change in enthalpy values and get our final answer. So we add up these three values and we get negative 106 kilojoules. Um, so that would be our change in enthalpy for the reaction carbon and hydrogen forming. So here's our second example. I'm going to calculate the change in enthalpy for the following reaction. Hydrogen plus chlorine gases form two hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid gases. So we're given the following equations. Um, you'll notice that we do have our hydrogen and our chlorine in these reactions, but we also have a lot of nitrogen, we have ammonia, we have things that are combined with it. So we want to end up crossing out all of those chemicals in the end of the reaction by the end of this problem. And just being left with our hydrogen, chlorine, and hydrochloric acid. So we're going to break this down into steps. So we take a look at our first thing, hydrogen. We can look down at our two at our reactions and you can you'll notice we have hydrogen in the second reaction and H2 hydrogen in the third reaction. So when you're faced with something like this, it's a good idea to hold off on doing the hydrogen because it's in multiple places 
it's going to be difficult to make it work. Once you figure out the other chemicals, we'll come back to that. So we want to find our chlorine. Um, the only thing that has Cl2 is our very last reaction. Um, that Cl2, you want to see, is it on the correct side? Is it the correct amount? It is on the correct side of the reaction, the left as a reactant, and it has the correct coefficient. So that last reaction, um, the third one, we will just simply recopy and leave its delta H value alone. So that gives us our chlorine gas, and I'm going to go ahead and put a box around it. The next thing is to find your hy the hydrochloric acid, the HCl. We can see that appears in the first reaction difference. So we have NH3 gas plus hy hy HCl, hydrochloric acid gas, forming NH4Cl solid. So the HCl, first thing, it's not on the correct side, so we're going to have to flip our reaction. And it is not the correct amount. We're going to have to multiply that reaction by 2. So here's our new reaction with NH4Cl as a reactant, and then ammonia and hydrochloric acid as products. And then our coefficients of 2 on everything because we multiply the reaction by 2 to get our 2 HCl. So for our delta H, we are going to flip its sign and make it positive, and we are going to multiply its value by 2 so we get positive 350 BQ. We're going to put a box around hydrochloric acid to show that we have that piece. So now we are down to the hydrogen gas. Um, there's a couple ways we can look at this last reaction that we have. So this last reaction is the middle one, N2 plus 3H2 gives us 2NH3. One way you can look at this is trying to figure out how to make your hydrogens work out. So we already have four hydrogens from this reaction here. Um, so we can think about how can we get less, we need only one hydrogen. So we need at least three of them to cancel out. So if we were to take the middle reaction, N2 plus 3H2, and reverse it, the three hydrogens would be on the right side, and then we could cancel out three of the hydrogens. Another way we could think about this is trying to get the NH3 and the N2 to cancel out with the other NH3 and N2 in the reaction. We want to make sure that they're on opposite sides of the ones that are already there, so that they will cancel out, because those do not appear, they're up here in our original reaction at all. So either way you look at this, we do need to flip that middle reaction. So here's our new reaction. We've got the NH3 as a reactant, and then nitrogen and hydrogen as products. So all we're going to do with delta H is flip its sign to positive 92 kilograms. Now, we're going to take a look at figuring out the rest of this. It would be a good idea right now to go ahead and cancel things out that we can, and we want to get to care of that hydrogen. So we've got N2, it cancels out. We've got the NH4Cl, two of those, and those both cancel out. So we have that in the product and the reactant then. Our NH3, the ammonia, will cancel out. And now we're left with three hydrogens on the right and four hydrogens on the left. So we can cancel out three of those hydrogens, so all three on the right. And then three out of the four on the left, leaving us with our one single hydrogen we need for our reaction to make the reaction. So that is our second equation. Um, now all we have to do is add up our change in enthalpy values, and we can see that we get negative 185 kilojoules. So hopefully that helps in getting you guys started on these re um, reactions. If you need to see more examples, um, it'd be a good idea to just search on YouTube for enthalpy of reaction um, examples. I'm sure you can find some. I also posted a, another video from Khan Academy that could be helpful as well. So take a look at that if you're still there. Thanks.